Welcome back everybody to video number two. This one's going to be about the short-term causes of World War I. And so the difference here is why does World War I begin specifically in the summer of 1914? So last time when we left off, we looked at the four main causes of World War I, which is militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Today we're gonna to start with the pit with the, and pick up with the, the concept of nationalism and we're going to look specifically at the problems going on in the Balkans. So if we look at the Balkans, of course, you can see we're down here in southeastern Europe. We've got the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the north. We've got the Russian Empire in the east. We've got the dying Ottoman Empire in the south. Well, if we make a connection back to, this, to, to previous material that we've already covered, we should remember, hopefully, that in 1905, Russia lost a war to the new Japanese Empire. And because Russia lost a war to the Japanese Empire, other people started to think that maybe they were vulnerable and maybe they could take advantage of Russia's perceived weakness. So on October 6th of 1908, Austria-Hungary announced that it was going to directly take control of the territory of Bosnia, and Herzegovina, which you can see on the map in yellow between Serbia and uh, Austria-Hungarian uh, Austria Empire. 1908, Austria-Hungary takes control, direct control of Bosnia and Herzegovina and makes it part of their empire. Now, this really scared a lot of people, and the people who were really, really scared were the people in Serbia, because they were pretty sure that they were going to be next. Now, the one big thing they've got going for them is the Serbian people also know that they have a secret alliance with the Russian Empire, so they think that's going to keep them safe. But, of course, there are still some people out there who are really, really super angry and upset about that. So a group of Serbian nationalists formed together and formed a group which was called the Black Hand. And the Black Hand was a Serbian nationalist group that was completely and totally obsessed with keeping Serbia an independent country. Now, there's problems that go back and forth in, in the spring and the summer of 1914, and basically things start to really kind of boil up in uh, the early summer of 1914. So what happens is that the Austro-Hungarians decide to have a meeting and sit down with everyone and try to work through these problems to try to get peace in the Balkans region. And so they hold this meeting in the city of Sarajevo, which you can see there, it's S-A-R-A-J-E-V-O, Sarajevo, which is right in the heart of Bosnia-Herzegovina. It's very close to Serbia. They invite all different kinds of people to come to Sarajevo in the summer of 1914. And they also send the number two most important guy in the Austro-Hungarian Empire to be their representative and to try to work for peace. His name was Franz Ferdinand, and we're looking at him here along with his wife, the, Arch the, the Duchess, Zoe, Sophie, I'm sorry, Sophie of Hohenberg, who was a German. Now, Franz Ferdinand was the, the number two most important person in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and he and his wife had a really big problem because he actually outranked her. And so inside the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they weren't actually allowed to be seen together in public. They couldn't ride together in a car. They couldn't go together to a party and enter the party at the same time. They really looked at this as, as a problem inside of Austria-Hungary, but... They also looked at the opportunity to go to Sarajevo, and they said, well, in Sarajevo, we can ride together in a car, we can walk into a room together, we can have kind of a, a little almost marital vacation together away from the problems in Austria-Hungary. And so the two of them decide that they're both going to go together to the city of Sarajevo to negotiate peace. When they get there, of course, the thing to keep in mind is the alliance system has already been set up everyone's going through going through the process of nationalism they've got an arms race everyone's geared up and ready for war and everybody's hoping that archduke franz ferdinand is going to go to sarajevo and make sure that this war doesn't happen now there's a couple of problems with that first of all the black hand looks at archduke franz ferdinand coming to sarajevo and they assume he's coming there to try to get control of serbia too problem number two they published his parade route in the newspaper about a week before he got there. 
Using that, the Black Hand organized an assassination attempt, and they used six assassins. On June the 28th, 1914, we're actually looking at the parade route here on the map, Franz Ferdinand paraded from the airport to City Hall in Sarajevo. Now, when he passed the first assassin, he didn't do anything at all. He passed the second assassin, who also didn't do anything at all. When he passed the third assassin, a guy named Kabrinovich, Kabrinovich was armed with a bomb. Basically, think about it like a grenade. Kabrinovich pulled the pin on the grenade and threw it towards the car that the Archduke and his wife were riding in. Now, the problem is it bounced off of the car and hit the ground where the fuse went off and actually set the bomb off to blow up the next car back in the parade. Um, it, it, it hurt about, you know, 20 people or something like that. Kabrinovich himself then actually panicked and assumed he was going to get caught, so he jumped over the side of a railing into the river which you can see on the map there. Uh, and, and also, before he jumped, he took his cyanide pill so that he could commit suicide. Now, the problem is, his cyanide pill was actually really old, and so it didn't kill him, but it just did really make him super sick, and he started to throw up all over the place. Problem number two was, the summertime of 1914 was really, really super hot, and so the water level in the river was very, very low. It was less than that, less than a foot deep. Uh, so when he jumped over the side, he actually got stuck in the mud. He broke one of his legs, and he was stuck there until the police eventually came and fished him out of the river, and then dragged him off to to prison. Um, but he didn't get the Archduke. Now, once the bomb went off, the Archduke's driver immediately started to speed at super high speed towards this towards the town hall. The other three assassins heard the bomb go off, didn't know what happened, couldn't take action when the, when the Archduke's car was speeding away, and so basically they gave up. Now one of those guys, a guy named Gavrilo Prinkip, which is G-A-V-R-I-L-O, P-R-I-N-C-I-P. He decided that the assassination was a total failure, and so he went into a little sandwich shop and started to have his lunch and, and started to drink a little bit, and he, he started to kind of be upset by the fact that they missed the Archduke. The Archduke then started his meeting. He got people together. He started to work on a, you know, towards a peace process while his security guards were talking about how do we get this guy out of here because we know that there are assassins outside. So they were supposed to go one direction, and instead what they decided to do was to throw a monkey wrench in whatever plans the assassins had and to go back the way they came from. So you can see there on the map the red line uh, moving from number three to number four is his route away from Sarajevo Town Hall back towards the, um, uh, towards the, uh, the airport. Now the problem is once they got up to where the Latin Bridge is on your map, his driver made a mistake and he accidentally turned right. And when he turned right, he hit a traffic jam, and the car came to a stop. Now, the really unusual part is the car came to a stop right outside of a little sandwich shop where Gavrilo Prinkip just happened to be walking out, totally depressed that they missed the assassination attempt, looked up and saw the Archduke and his wife in front of him. So Gavrilo Prinkip pulled out his pistol and started shooting into the car, hitting both Sophie and Archduke Franz Ferdinand. They rushed both of them to the hospital, but our, uh, Sophie who actually died on the scene, and Franz Ferdinand was taken to the hospital. They didn't tell him that his wife was dead because they were afraid that he was going to give up, and his last words were, at least Sophie survives, shortly before he himself died. Gavrilo Prinkip was then beaten by the crowd and arrested, and he was given 20 years in prison, where he would eventually die in the 1920s. Now... This comes to be called the July Crisis, because all throughout July, Austria-Hungary demands that Serbia do an investigation and is, is totally sure that Serbia was behind this assassination. Now, Serbia is not going to be pushed around because they're afraid they're going to get conquered by Austria-Hungary, and Serbia knows secretly that Russia's got their back. And so Serbia is kind of playing the kind of pain in the neck, saying, we won't let you do anything, and you're not going to stop us. Austria-Hungary makes a demand. It's called the ultimatum. And what they say is, we demand that you allow our police officers to watch while your police officers do the investigation. And Serbia flat out refuses that. Now when they flat out refuse that, Austria-Hungary decides to go to war. 
The ultimatum came on July the 23rd. And what you can see here is Serbia, the little shrimpy guy there on the left-hand side, says, if you touch me, I'll. And then Austria says, if you make a move, I'll. And behind him, what he can't see is Russia's there, and then Germany is there to protect their ally, Austria. And then coming up in the background is France and Britain, who, of course, have an alliance with Russia. So if Germany goes to war against Russia, the other two are getting dragged into it. So really, all of these major European powers are set up kind of like dominoes. Now... The issue here becomes the ultimatum is made on July the 23rd. Serbia agreed to a lot of the demands on the 25th, but also they decided that things were getting a little crazy, and so Serbia decided to mobilize its army just in case anything happened. Austria ultimately declared war on Serbia on July 28th, so it's really, really important for later on that you guys remember that Austria declares war on Serbia first on July 28th. Russia then issues an, or I'm sorry, Germany then issued an ultimatum to Russia that says you need to stop getting your army together because there's really no reason for you to be doing that. On August 1st, France and Germany got their armies together. Germany declared war on Russia because Russia kept getting its army together. On August 2nd, Germany and the Ottoman Empire signed an alliance. On August 3rd, Germany declared war on France after they refused to remain neutral. And now we are full on into the First World War where all the alliance systems come together. Everybody's declared war on everybody else. And it's going to be time for a slugfest in the end of the summer of 1914. Now, the other significant part is most of these people, because they buy into the idea of militarism, when they got ready to go and they were very excited, excited to start this war, the, the word on everyone's lips is, don't worry, we'll be home by Christmas of 1914. So next time what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the opening part of the fighting in World War I. We'll look at the von Schlieffen plan and how the war actually comes to be and what the fighting looks like and, and, and just how World War I actually plays out. So I will see you guys later. I hope this video is just as useful as the last one, if not more so. And let me know what you think on the Google Classroom chat.